Hello everyone and welcome to another installment of Hatfield Currents. I'm Mike Cahill and uh, our guest today is uh, Marla Miller. Marla is the professor and director of the public history program at the University of Massachusetts. Uh, Hatfield Currents historical shows typically feature residents of Hatfield, but not today. It so happens that Marla Miller does not live in town. She lives in Hadley, actually. Mm -hmm. But she's authored something that should be of interest to all of us who do live in town and to many people who may not live in town. In 1998, by arrangement with the Colonial Society of Massachusetts, the New England Quarterly published a winning essay of the 1997 Walter Muir Whitehill Prize in Colonial History. That essay was written by Marla. It is entitled, My Part Alone. It's about a woman named Rebecca Dickinson. Rebecca lived in Hatfield for 77 years in her family salt box house on Main Street. Interestingly enough, Rebecca lived alone for most of her adult life until her death in 1815. Most unusual is that Rebecca kept personal journals, not only of what it was like to live during that time, but also about her personal trials and tribulations, living as a single woman during the mid to late 18th century. So without further ado, we want to get into this a little bit further. Welcome, Marla, to Hatfield Currents. Well, thanks for having me. Um, before we get into the, to the, to the essay itself uh, that you wrote about Rebecca Dickinson, let's talk first about, about you. Yeah. Uh, and can you share a little bit of background about personal background and your educational background and sure. what you're doing now? And sure. I uh, grew up in South Central Wisconsin mm -hmm. and went to the University of Wisconsin-Madison for my undergraduate work yeah. and was a cultural history major. And in my junior year, one of my favorite professors, Sergeant Bush in the English department, told me about a summer fellowship program out here in Western Mass that was for students thinking about careers in museums. And so as a junior in college, I drove out to Western Mass and spent the summer up at Historic Deerfield, wow. best summer of my life, and spent the summer learning about what museum work is and, and learning about New England history. And in the course of that summer, I, I was doing a research project on ministers' wives in the 18th century. We all had to do a research project. Yeah. And so I uh, was studying the wife of um, Reverend Lyman here in Hatfield through the diary of this woman, Rebecca Dickinson. Dickinson had been friends with the minister's family. Okay. And so I was just using the diary to study the minister okay. and his wife. And at the conclusion of the summer, Kevin Sweeney, who was director of academic programs then, he's now at Amherst College, mm -hmm. suggested that maybe that diary needed to be studied. And so my senior thesis at Wisconsin was transcribing that diary from the beginning to the end and writing a little introduction to it. Mm. And I carried that project down to the University of North Carolina where I went to graduate school and wrote my master's thesis on Dickinson mm. as a spinster, and that's what that article comes out of. Yeah. And yeah. then um, that evolved into a dissertation about women in the clothing trades. I realized Dickinson was a gown maker, and that mm -hmm. led me to the diary of Elizabeth Porter Phelps in Hadley. Okay. That That's became... a familiar, familiar name. Exactly, sure. yep. Yeah. Space that Dickinson knew well, that Historic House Museum. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote my dissertation on that. That became my first book. And have now, of course, relocated to Western Mass. I've been at UMass for about 12 years. Enjoying that. Yeah. And now, that article, all these years later, uh, a, uh, a series on the lives of early American women is being developed at Westview Press. And the editor of the series has asked me to convert the article um, that I wrote in 1998 into a short book about Rebecca Dickinson's whole life. And so I've been back in Hatfield the last year trying to sort of fill in the gaps and think about her life, you know, the whole yeah, scope of her life, exactly, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, so there's actually maybe, there is, I guess, on the plate more to come about yeah. Rebecca, yes. Rebecca Dickinson. Yes. That's great. So, I mean, you started to give us a little bit of background in terms of how this, how this essay, if you will, kind of, kind of 
came to reality and, mm -hmm. and, to, and to fruition. But but let's let's get back a little bit more to um, you know the substance of it mm -hmm. um, because it's um, it's difficult for people who are watching to to kind of have some sense as to what we're really talking about. Um, can you give us some 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 highlights, maybe, perhaps maybe an outline? Of the, of the essay, if you haven't gotten the gist of this uh, as yet, as I said in, in our introduction, uh, Rebecca Dickinson was a spinster. Um, she was an unmarried woman in the mid to late, late 18th century. And in a sense, the, the essay is all about um, uh, her feelings, her emotions, uh, her ups and downs as an unmarried woman, a very rare, uh, circumstance that's right uh, for women to be in at that point in time um, throughout her entire adult life so mm -hmm. so uh, let's talk about um, you know the maybe the sequence of the essay right uh, not not necessarily getting into it in a lot of detail but right. um, yeah the the diary is so powerful and and when I was an undergraduate and I first started to read through it her voice is so striking. So the diary begins in 1787 when she's about to turn 50. Right. And she has kept a diary her whole adult life. Right. But as she's about to turn 50, she decided that she should rededicate her life to God and, right. and sort of lay aside these secular writings too, too involved in the worldly concerns of the day. She should be setting her sights higher. Right. And so right. she burns her older diary, heartbreaking for historians when we learn about people burning right. diaries. And she, she starts again, and, and the diary, when it was discovered in the 1890s uh, by a Hatfield resident, Margaret Miller, Margaret tried to publish it then, okay. and publishers said it was too dolefully dolesome, too <laughs> awfully theological and metaphysical yeah. for their pages. And it is. It's a sad, sad text, because right. it was the place that she put all of the feelings she had about being a never married woman Alone. in a society that didn't have a place right. for women outside marriage and family. And so, you know, she had this sense that everybody was looking at her and everybody was speculating about what was wrong with her. Right. And she speculated. Right. In the diary, she would say, God must hate me. What have I done to deserve this? You know, what, what crime right. have I committed? And then the next page will be, God must love me. He knows that I would be too distracted by the cares of a family. You know, right. he's trying to keep my focus on the, the right things. Right. And so it's a gesture of his love. And so the diary is a place for her to work all this out. Right. And so when I was transcribing it as a, a college student, it really kind of became like her psychologist. Yeah, you, will, you know, you're just really probing it. Yeah. Now, do you think? Let me ask you uh, to interject. Yeah. Do you think that um, it was typical back then for most women to keep diaries, or do you think that the reason that this diary and um, and the other her other writings exist, mm -hmm. her journals, uh, is because she needed to do that? To, to mentally just feel comfortable right. in the situation that she was in. Right, it's a little bit of both. I mean, there's a strong tradition in New England for both women and men to keep spiritual journals, okay. to keep a record of the state of their soul. So it's not right. unprecedented. Okay. And, and we do have other journals from women in this area, um, like Elizabeth Porter Phelps, although Elizabeth Porter Phelps is lifelong diary that also survives, she calls a memorandum book, and she's using that <laughs> To remember, you know, when they planted this or that, and when they started the sausages, and who was doing the weaving, it's not introspective at all. Okay. Dickinson. It's about the the then and the there, as opposed yeah, the, to the here and the now. Exactly. Like, like right. here, here's what's happening on the farm this week. Right. And Dickinson, as you suggest, is using the diary as a place to process. That's the, I think, term we would use today. She's got mm -hmm. to work these things through. Mm -hmm. Her sisters don't want to hear it. You right. know, it's it's a place to to kind of work through the sort of despair right. that you know she doesn't want to share with a lot of people and they frankly don't want to hear. And, and there's right. a, a pattern, at the end of her life she moves in with her nephew's family. Right. And she really pretty much gives up the diary. Once she's living in a busy family and there's a lot going on, no she doesn't to need write. it as much. Yeah. And so she, there are a few entries after that happens, but she really, you know, it's not the weekly meditation that it was for so long. Right. Now it's also interesting, um, not only from the, the journaling, it's not only interesting from getting her perspective on processing 
her situation, if you will, as a, uh, as a single woman, but she also does get into the ups and downs of taking care of an elder parent. Right. Which... Very familiar to us today. Exactly. Right? Her mom lived, her mother lived. Her mother, I mean, they, her mother was with her in that house for a long time, and right. then as her mother aged, she would spend part of the year with different children. So right. part of the year with her son, Samuel and Waitley, right. part of the year with Rebecca, and there's this annual angst about, you know, mother's coming back. She's coming. How we are to live, I don't know, because right. Rebecca is conscious of her own aging. What if she gets sick? and her mother is sick. Right. And right. there's this wonderful line where she, she says something about her mother in a puzzling fit, broke my spectacles, and how they're yes. replaced, I don't know. And, <laughs> and you can see she's, right. she's just frustrated. That right. like, like many single women in this period and in all periods, the family sort of decides that she's got the time, she doesn't have the demands that right. her sisters do, and so she can deal with this stuff. She also winds up taking care of one of her nephews who's also in, frail health. Right. And she gets frustrated by that too. And that's one of the great paradoxes of the diary. As much as she is lonesome, there is so much prose in here about how lonely she is. Right. When she's got people around her, she also finds that sort of irritating. She misses right. her privacy. Right. And yet there are times, and I've obviously read this, there are times in the, uh, in the essay where she would, she, it's bittersweet, um, taking care of her mother and, her, and or her nephew she sees positives and negatives to it. Right, right. I mean, the fact that she's not alone when they're there, I mean, she's, and she's got things to do, and, and, and she's obviously um, uh, assisting them um, in their challenges. And then, uh, and then she'll flip to the other side almost in the next, in the next sentence, right. saying, oh, my God, you know, this is really tough, and you know, I, 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 I'm really having a difficult time. Why is the Lord doing this to me? Exactly. That kind of thing. So, yeah, kind of an interesting, uh, an interesting... That's one of the things I love most about the diary and what has been fun about the project, because if you read 19th century reminiscences of Dickinson, when people started to take oral histories of Hatfield, they remember her in this very loving way. She was remembered as Aunt Beck, you know, mm -hmm. this community figure. Yeah. People thought of her as something as an oracle. She, mm -hmm. she apparently you know, had a sense of humor. I gather from what I can tell in the diary, she mm -hmm. had a rather sharp wit. She, she yeah. hung around with some of the women in town who are also known to have large personalities. Yes. And so you can kind of imagine the sort of woman she was. Right. And it doesn't necessarily match up with this melancholic figure that comes out of the diary. Right, and she even, she even talks about uh, how she frequents a tavern. Yes. Quite, right. quite often. She's, well, there's a funny passage. I only <laughs> With, just... Without really getting into a lot of the, <laughs> right. Right. the, the details of what transpired there, and the tavern was, a, was in the family, yes. right? It was a Billings right. family who operated the tavern. Um, but she did frequent the tavern quite, quite right. often. Although there's one entrance. So she does that because she's a woman alone, and it's just easier to eat yes, where a big meal absolutely. is being prepared yeah. than to prepare a meal for herself. Yeah. So she goes down there to board. And that's her source of company, and that's perfect right. for her. She can go down there, see people, socialize, and then retreat to her house. But there's one passage right. that I only discovered. I, I've read this diary a thousand times, but I only this, you know, last spring found a passage where she has tried beer, and it didn't agree with her. She has a lot of regrets <laughs> about that evening. So, uh, so I don't know how much drinking she was doing, but um, but she loves being right. at the tavern. Yeah. And she and she's so explicit in in her feelings when she would return from the tavern and, and the hustle and bustle there and the, and the, the company and, and the camaraderie that was happening there. And then, and then even though she may not have been personally involved in, in what was transpiring, she was at least watching it and being able to observe it. She'd come back to her house and it would be just so quiet, mm -hmm. you know, that, that she really felt so incredibly alone. Right. Uh, upon her returns from the from right. the tavern, it's really interesting her her perspective. Right. Another place you see that that's very moving to me is as a gown maker, one of one of the main sources of income for her is marriage. When when there's a wedding, uh, she right. will fit out right. the bride. She will fit out the bridesmaids. Guests yeah. will need things, and so when there's a wedding coming up, you know there's a fair amount of business that right. that generates for her, right. and of course she's a gown maker. That's that's her source of income, it's her source of creativity. She gets to mm -hmm. work with the fabric, she gets to make people beautiful. Right. And then she goes to the wedding and everybody's there paired off mm -hmm. and she'll say, I have no part, no portion there. She feels 
you know, redundant in this you know, room full of couples. Right. And it's heartbreaking. Like there she is with all the beautiful dresses that she that helped she created. make. Right. And she feels it's just such a source she's of still, pain. She's still, obviously she's not involved. She doesn't really belong. Yeah, or she feels that way. Yeah. She feels that yeah. way. So, um, yeah. yeah, that's a, another one of those moments. Right. So, so Marla, let's talk about the, it, for you, you guys that are watching, um, it, you know, you really do need to, to, to read this if you get a chance. It's, it's incredibly interesting essay that Marla's created. And we'll talk maybe in a few minutes about where you can see this or get a hold of a copy. Let's talk about the process. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you know, you know, what was what was your pro? I mean, you, you began to talk about you know when you were in school, this kind of began, and you yeah. were getting you know into it a little bit. But but what was the research process actually like? I mean, wh where did you come across these this journal or this diary yeah. or whatever? And how how did you? It's um, I, I feel so lucky to be the one to have first written about this uh, at the time that I was an undergraduate. The diary was still in family hands, and it was with some Billings descendants living in Florida. Okay. And Kevin Sweeney was aware of that. And there was a photocopy that was up at Memorial Library in Deerfield, Deerfield. Mm -hmm. uh, because a student, a UMass student in the 80s maybe, had done a project on Rebecca Dickinson, and so the diary was photocopied for her. Then when I took the project up, it was microfilmed, and so I took okay. that out to Wisconsin. So the first step was really immersing myself in the diary and finding the themes. Right. You know, singlehood, her religious struggle. Uh, the diary has some tantalizing evidence within it about why she's single. There's a little jilting story that comes out in the corners of the text that mm -hmm. I wanted to probe. So the first thing was really looking through the diary, what's here? And then it's, it's kind of good old-fashioned social history, filling in the blanks. And that's what I've been doing now as I'm converting the article to the book, is to go through the church records. Where can I find evidence in the church records of events that are important to her? Can I find her family members in the church right. records? Can I find um, her, her minister sermons that might shed some light on, on the things she would have heard right. in the church. Now she was a member of the Hatfield Congregational Hatfield Church. Hatfield Congregational and it's, Church. And it's, it's rather interesting because <laughs> um, um, in order to become a member of the church back in, that, in those days, it, is that you had to have a public confession. You had to have a conversion and she, experience. And, yes, and she talks about the minister at that point in time and how much she admired him and whatever. So, That's right, and she yeah. makes this important statement about the year that she converted. She was 23, the same year when other women choose a mate. Choose the mate. And so right. she thinks of that as her sort of dedication to God and the mm -hmm. beginning of her adult life. Right. So you start with the church records, see what that fills in. Then you go to the tax records, see what that fills in. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. any public record you sort of comb through trying mm -hmm. to contextualize, you know, the major events of her life. Right. So I've read, you know, Joseph Lyman published several sermons. I've read through those to see, mm -hmm. you know, what sorts of things she was hearing at church. Now, were you, were you as you did this <clears throat> research, as you were uncovering uh, the substance, if you will, were you writing at, this, at, mm -hmm. at the same time? What were you doing? Taking notes? What, you know, was this, how did this all come together, I guess? I um, tend to write as I research, okay. and I tell my students not to do that. I'm not sure it's the best thing, but uh, I like to start writing right away. You know, mm -hmm. I just, you know, thinking, thinking You're ideas journaling. through. Yeah, <laughs> thinking ideas through as I'm writing. So I do, I do. I knew as soon as I read the uh, line in, in Margaret Miller's papers about this diary being too dolefully dulcome, I knew that would be in the opening. Yeah, um, yeah. There's a wonderful passage in Dickinson's diary where she opens by saying two is better than one, you know, and she right. sort of contemplates on, on how hard it is to be alone, that it's better to be part of a pair. And so I knew the minute I saw that, that's the article's opening. Yeah. And so I sort of put things where I know, I build the scaffolding as I go and then right. develop it. Right, right, yeah, interesting. Now, in, how about in terms of the, the so the publication of it. You, I mean, you mm -hmm. finally have completed this 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 essay, yep. which is uh, 30, 35, 40 pages Something long. Something like that, yeah. Um, book pages, if you will. Um, and uh, then then what? Then 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 what happened to it? And how and and how? You know, what happened to it since you've yep. since you authored it? If yep. You will. Yep. Um, because you completed it in nineteen ninety eight. So yeah, it's been it's quite a while ago. Fourteen years or yes, so. Yes. Wow. Then. I guess so. <laughs> time flies. Yeah. I, I was working at, by that time I had finished my master's thesis on her at the University of North Carolina. And okay. so, you know, it's sort of, 
encouraged in graduate school to develop your thesis into an article and start developing a publication record for the job market. Mm -hmm. And so sure. I had written up an article based on my thesis. And this Whitehill Prize that you mentioned is the prize for the best essay submitted to them in colonial history. Yep. And so I submitted the article for the White Hill Prize and was very pleased that it won. And so then yep. the New England Quarterly has a commitment to publish the winner of the White Hill Prize okay. every year. Okay. And so the next thing you know, Rebecca was making her way into print. Now when, when the uh, New England Quarterly publishes something, is that in the public domain? It is, is. It is. Okay. It, it's, um, so different libraries carry it. Of course, UMass carries it. It's also been republished in a book called Extraordinary Women, Ordinary Lives by Krista Lindenmeyer. So it, that might be an easier way for people to get a hold of it than the journal. Okay. Is, um, uh, so, there, so the journal, the original journal is, is, is where? Well, UMass carries it. Okay. The New England Quarterly, you mean, or you mean the right. original I'm diary? About the, actually, the original oh, diary. Yes, I'm now just, uh, now that's been um, donated to Memorial Libraries up in Deerfield. So that's in Deerfield. Hmm, yep, too the, bad it's not in Hatfield. Well, uh, <laughs> there is the what one. What can Hatfield do to get that? Get those, <laughs> that journal? Yeah, I doubt that they uh, they're letting it go. But uh, but in Hatfield, there is a piece of her needlework uh, remaining. There's a fire screen in the Hatfield Historical Society that is said to have been made by Dickinson. It's a uh, uh, flame-stitched fire screen, you know, in the 18th century, these, these square pieces of needlework protected women's faces from the fire, okay. and so it's on a pole. Right. And so that is believed oh, to have been made by Dickinson, and um, three pieces of her needlework survive up at Memorial Libraries as well. And one of them, you know, thinking about the research process, another thing that I like to think about is material culture. How do artifacts you know, help me understand my project right. too. Uh, unfortunately, Dickinson's house doesn't, doesn't survive. Right. It, it came down in the mid 19th that was, century. That was right on Main Street, by the way, right across from the old where the old meeting house was. That's right. Uh, and if anybody and knows of a photograph taken before that house came down, I would be eager to know. Uh, it was a red salt box that stood across from the meeting house. Right now, do you know was that on the west side or the east side of the, the meeting it house? It would be on the east side of the street, towards the river. Correct. Okay. Yep. All right. Hmm. Yep. So, um, so material right. culture is important, and, and one of the best artifacts related to her is this cruel worked coverlet that she rendered, it looks like 1765, that has a mystery on it, and of all things, a code. And so, <laughs> in, as if she's not, you know, teasing mysterious me enough, enough right? right? As yeah. if she's not mysterious enough, in the 1760s, the, the cruel work is dated, although it it looks like it's dated in another hand, so the 1765 date is a little bit bracketed. But she made a curl work coverlet, and many, many women made curl work coverlets in the period. It was very fashionable. Mm -hmm. By and large, they have floral patterns on them, you know, vines mm -hmm. and carnations, and sometimes birds and butterflies and right. things like that. Um, Dickinson's, like almost no other, has a sailing ship in the middle. Now, so far as I know, really? Dickinson never saw an ocean-going vessel. Why she would make a coverlet with a giant sailing ship in the middle, I don't know. On top of that, it has a code on it. Mm. So below the sailing ship are a series of letters, and I believe it's F-O-A-W-T-W-A, -W -A, and then there's a space, C-O-G-V-I-U-S-A, and I... I couldn't crack the code in 1998, and when I returned to this project, to the, to the book length version just this last year, mm -hmm. I thought, well, finally, I will have a chance to crack the code. I'm 14 years older and wiser. Oh, I, I surely right. now know how to, to do this. this. Yeah. Cannot do it. Still not. I have tried. I, I suspect that, it is, that those letters are each the first letter of a word in a, in a hymn or a Bible verse. Mm -hmm. And I have thoroughly checked Watts' hymnal, which is the hymnal in use in the church at the time. I have looked through the Bible. I am still stumped. And so if any viewer has a notion about what those letters could stand for, I would be very eager to hear about that the, as well. well. Said, didn't you say the last three letters were USA? Yes, so but that's it's... that's pretty obvious. No, because no? it predates. It's 1765, long before oh, the that's, revolution. That's true. So I... Uh, yes, yeah. I do not know. I have a little bit of a notion about some of that's it, but... That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's got something to do with the boat. Well, I expect it does. 
but I hope it does, but, but that so far has not helped me crack it. So, so it's a puzzle. The boat is also incorrectly rendered in that it's going two directions at once. The, the sails are billowing the wrong oh, way. Oh, really? And so she, I suspect, is working from a print source that is incorrect, but I haven't been able to find the print source either. So, wow. it, so yet another puzzle that she is going to continue to keep because I don't think I'll solve it before the book is due. So you, um, you did something recently with the library, is that correct? Or did you not here in Hatfield? Yes, well, I've been over there. Okay, um, with the, with the, the piano garments? Piano scarf. Okay, okay yeah, scarf. Um, yeah, Kathy was nice, Kathy Gow at the Historical Society was nice enough to alert me to a piano scarf that was made. And now I won't get all the, these dates right, but the short of it is that Dickinson had sort of a revival. After her diary was discovered and her needlework being up at Memorial Library, mm -hmm. in the late 19th century, there was an arts and crafts revival here in the Valley. And women interested in needlework looked at the 18th century needlework and then sort of Had reprised it. it in more okay. modern forms. Mm -hmm. And so the famous example of that is the Deerfield Society of Blue and White Needlework, which is a very important arts and crafts group mm. in the nation, let alone the Valley. And they looked at Rebecca Dickinson's 18th century needlework and then adapted her patterns. And one of the people who also did that was someone here in Hatfield who took, who took thread, linen thread, that had survived and was woven at a later date. It's all these dates in time, and I, and I don't know them by heart, but there's thread that was linen woven by one woman at one point, woven into cloth by another woman, and then this person made a piano scarf out of it and embroidered on the piano scarf an homage to Dickinson's cruel work. And so okay. three early American women's labors are represented in this piano scarf made by a fourth woman mm -hmm. here in Hatfield. And so Kathy, you know, thought I should see that. And it really is a wonderful, wonderful artifact. So I was there in the library looking at okay. that. Okay. Um, Marla, as you were, I'm just kind of curious, you know, because as I was reading this, I started to think about you. Hmm. Um, as you were writing this as, as a woman. Yeah. Writing about a, a spinster right. from 250 years ago, right. um, seeing these, these various phrases and, and, and comments that she was making about her life, which were all over the place in terms of emotion, what were you feeling? Yeah, that's such a great question. When I first started working on this, you know, so I'm a college senior. Right. College seniors are full of their own angst, right? Right. And so I would you know, be there, it took me most of a year to transcribe the diary, you know, working a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, through the semesters. She writes, here I am again in this old house alone 150 times in the diary. My own romantic fortunes as they waxed and waned that year, sometimes <laughs> okay, that, yeah. you know, you're, you're you like, to, mm. oh my God, I, here I am again in this old house alone transcribing the diary of this 18th century spinster. Okay, yeah. And so you, you, know, you kind of connect to the diary in different ways at different times. So when right. I was younger right. and writing about the spinster, you know, when I'm also thinking, will I ever marry, you know, that right. kind of thing, right. you know, you're caught up in it. Yeah. And then I notice, you know, revisiting it years later, it's different things, like the relationship with her mother. Right. You know, as I'm getting older, as my mother's getting older, yeah. I notice that caretaking part more. Mm -hmm. and, and a newest epiphany is her relationship with her nieces and nephews. Now I have several nieces, nieces and, nephews. and nephews. I think okay. a lot about my role as aunt. I hadn't really yeah. picked up on the theme in the diary about yeah. what she calls her little cousins. And right. Now, I have added some prose in the manuscript about Rebecca Dickinson as aunt, because now that I'm an aunt, right. I notice that more. Right. And so you do have Are a tendency. Are you known as Aunt Marl? Oh, gosh, <laughs> I, I, hope <laughs> <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. Yeah, so, uh, um, so you do. Yeah. You tend to see things as, I would as, imagine you, that as you things. Right, as you, as you continue to age, yep. uh, you must, you can't help but reflect back to, to this woman right you know that you've written about and studied for so many years right. um, in, in terms of her own personal situation right you yeah. just see things that you wouldn't have seen before yeah. and then you know as i mature as a historian i notice things that right. you know it didn't make sense to me the first time or you know i wasn't interested in the first time but right. but 
come to be interesting. And but so, so she's, I mean, she's, she's probably imparted, I mean, as you, and I hate to say, as you get, uh, move along more in, in life, it's, it's almost like she, you, you're a wiser woman for e each year that you, you do age mm -hmm. because she has imparted a certain degree of wisdom to you that most women your age, if you will, don't have. Yeah, that's right. That's probably that's true. Interesting. You know, you spend that amount of time with somebody and you really, right. you know, sort of, yeah. you know, I don't want to say wallow in, but I have spent so much time with that text. Yeah. I often think about yeah. that. People ask me about my relationship to her in a way, you know, in, in the article right. that you read, I speculate as to why she never married. And right. I, I think there's a lot going on there. Uh, partly it is the fact that she has a trade that allows her to decline opportunities exactly. to marry, which we which know is, she did do. She did have. And right. so it's not that she was single for lack of any offer. She declined the offers that right. we have. And it's partly her access to an income that made that possible for her. And I think there are other things going on there too. She describes being jilted, which I think probably happened, right. but also was a story that women were allowed to tell. Like if you, if somebody right. in the 18th century said, why aren't you married? You, you're really That's not allowed to say, it's not my thing. Exactly. You have to have a broken heart or you have to say, oh, I never married because I had to care for my aged parent. Mm, right. You know, there are these kinds of things. Right. So, um, so I do think about the sort of hubris in that, you know, who am I to speculate why this woman 200 right. years ago never Didn't. married? And yet I feel like, well, I've spent a lot of time with her, um, really trying to understand her life. And right. so I, I hope I am respectfully conjecturing about what that diary sure means. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but it is sort of a funny position to be in. Right. So if this, um, if this essay were to ever be a book. Mm -hmm. Which it will be. Okay. <laughs> Next year. Oh, all right, then maybe, maybe you've already got the answers to this question. What will the inside front cover of this book say? Hmm. And what will the back cover say on this book, which is usually reviews from different oh. book reviewers? Um, Interesting. Well. I, I will know that better in a day or two because the uh, pages have been shipped by the editor and so I am awaiting a package. Um, so it is going to be published though? Yes, yes. As a, as a standalone? As a standalone book. Oh. Westview Press, which is a division of Perseus, okay. is bringing it out in this Lies of American Women series. Okay. okay. So it will, yeah, okay. sometime next year, w should come out, um, oh, I expect, maybe next summer. Yeah. And what I hope it says is that she gives us a view that we don't have on women in this period. Um, right. As you've mentioned, you know, far and away the majority of women married. Right. And here is a reminder that not everybody conformed to that path. And how can we learn and think about the revolution and that right. era in new ways from the point of view of a working woman who had to get up in the morning and think about it. In fact, my, my thesis was called My Daily Bread Depends Upon My Labor. There's a moment in the diary where Dickinson is conflicted about whether to take a job. Her sister's coming, the house needs cleaning. You know, right. she, like us today, has to balance a lot of competing demands. Right. And she's, she's not sure whether she should take this job out of town, which, you know, will be yeah. sort of a trouble to get to. But as she concludes, my daily bread depends upon my labor. And so it, it reminds us that the way we often think about early American women, the sort of colonial good wife of popular historical imagination, doesn't tell us the whole story, that there were these skilled artisanal craftswomen right. who were self-supporting. Yeah, yeah. That was very interesting, very interesting. I mean, and then she, you know, getting into the, her, her, her income, if you will, that allowed her to, to self-support, um, you know, the, the, just the trials and tribulations of, of how dependent she was on her health. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, she basically, if you, you know, if she didn't work, she wasn't, Paid and and you know the, the health that she she talks about um, every fall I guess or late fall she ended up with some sort of a chronic yeah cough or or I've something. never been able to figure out what that is but it's some seasonal yeah maybe whether it's it was an allergy. allergy or whatever for her but nevertheless mm -hmm. she you know she almost knew to the 
to the day when it was going to begin and she almost could yeah. plan around it yeah. and uh, how she was bedridden for times and uh, but then the weather and then just you know other factors her mother coming in and her having to take care of her mom and yeah. you know the, the kinds of things that that uh, got in the way of, of income and how there were times where she just did not know where her next dollar was going to come from. Right, right. Um, but uh, somehow she made it, you know, she made it through. Marla, very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, writing essay, if you will. And I'm hoping that, that those of you who are watching today will get a, will get a chance to, uh, to, to read this um, at some point. Is, is there or will there be something at the Hatfield Library where I, people can... I hope so. I mean, I really want people in Hatfield to I have know. a chance I mean, to get I'm to know I'm sure her. people are now saying, well, all right, well, where do I go from here? Yes, right, uh, right. How do I get a, you know, a copy of this? Right. Because um, I'd, like I'd like to read it. Yeah. Um, well, I'm sure something could be worked out, and I would love to come over and, and talk about her in this town, of all places, where my, my career really began. Yeah. So it would be a real treat to get uh, to do that. Is that something that Kathy could, Kathy Gao could... Could oh, I, I should something. think so. And, yeah. All right. So, well, we'll, we'll you know try stay to let tuned. people know. Stay tuned. Uh, put something in the paper or whatever that. Or on Kathy's website, the Historical Society website is excellent. The Historical Society website might be a source of uh, where you're, where you could avail yourself of uh, of my part alone, um, hmm. and it's it's an incredibly interesting read. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, to convey to people is that. Uh, Somewhere in the in the essay, not only does this, does this essay talk about uh, Rebecca and her trials and tribulations, but there's there's a couple of spots that they talk, it talks about Hatfield. Um, and back in I guess it was 1790, uh, one of the first censuses was done in the United States, and um, Hatfield at that point um, had I think it was like six or seven hundred residents and one hundred and two homes. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, 20 years later in the next census, it was indicated that Hatfield had 120 homes. So it was a 20% growth, but, but nevertheless isn't a, isn't a terribly significant growth in terms of the number of, number of homes. But at some point in time, um, Marla indicates that there was a person who came through Hatfield for one reason or another. And his name was Timothy Dwight. Mm -hmm. I found this. I found this um, this portion of the essay really interesting because this was a quote from Timothy Dwight, who happened to come through Hatfield, and he <clears throat> made the the following observation about uh, our community, which was you know, this is about 300 years ago or thereabouts. Um, and this is what he. This is what Timothy Dwight in 1797 actually says about Hatfield. The inhabitants have for a long period been cons conspicuous for uniformity of character. They have less intercourse with their neighbors than those of most other places. An air of silence and retirement appears everywhere. Except for travelers, few persons are seen abroad, and I think that means out and about, besides those who are employed about their daily business. This seclusion probably renders them less agreeable to strangers, but certainly contributes to their pros prosperity. Accordingly, few farming towns are equally distinguished either for their property or for their thrift. And, and when I read that, I couldn't help but think that, hmm, that's, someone could describe Hatfield today hmm. the same way. Mm -hmm. that um, at least that's my sense, that the town, in terms of its basic nature and character, hasn't changed much since the year 1797 in terms of how it could per be perceived by uh, a stranger coming through town and just observing what transpires here. So I, I thought that that was kind of interesting, that the community really, um, in my estimation anyway, hasn't changed much in terms of character hmm. and nature. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, the Great Awakening rolled through the area, Hatfield was also a little cool on that, and I, you, that's a half century earlier. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting when you see towns have a certain personality. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, that's about all the time we have today for uh, this installment of uh, Hatfield Currents. We want to thank Marla Miller for, for a very interesting and informative visit. Um, you know, any other thoughts, Marla, that you'd like to share with 
with, with the viewers? Just, just what a pleasure it has been to do all of this research in Hatfield. The folks have been so welcoming and town hall when I've been doing research and at the library and just through town, it's been lovely to do work here. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Uh, for those of you who are watching from home, we wanna thank you very much for being with us today and we hope you did enjoy the show and we hope you know a little bit more, not only about our guest, Marla Miller, but perhaps more importantly, or most importantly, more about the life of, of a Hatfield resident uh, from 300 or so years ago, Rebecca Dickinson, and what she went through as a single woman during a time when single women were far and few between. To find out even more, be sure to read my part alone. It'll be published at some point within the next 12 to 18 months, and hopefully uh, the essay itself um, could be made available at the, at the, at the Hatfield Public Library. Um, more to come on that uh, at some point, so kind of keep your eyes and ears open for that. Um, and it's interesting, Rebecca, uh, I did want to leave one, one other quote with you guys. Uh, in Rebecca's words, um, it's about, the essay is about my difficult journey of life as a woman struggling to act her part alone. Just a reminder, we continue to look for uh, future guests and topic ideas for Hatfield Currents. So if any of you are interested, uh, feel free to contact uh, the uh, Hatfield Currents production team um, or me or email us or however you want to do that. Um, we'd, uh, we'd be interested to try to slot you in for, uh, for a show. Um, before I sign off, I do want to thank the Hatfield Currents uh, production team they're doing a great job, and without them, um, we wouldn't have this show at all. And uh, if you're interested, um, do email us uh, at HatfieldCurrents uh, at gmail.com as far as uh, additional shows and, uh, and even helping out here on, on the set. That would be wonderful. The other thing is that Hatfield Currents um, does have a blog, um, and I don't have the... Uh, I don't have the URL handy, but um, if, uh, you, if, you, if you Google Hatfield Currents uh, blog, I think you might find it on the, on the internet. It's also, I think there's a link on the town website to the blog, um, but uh, it's a blog where you can just share um, any feelings, comments, concerns, issues, or whatever about, about the town. Um, a reminder, the show is broadcast Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays at uh, 9 in the morning, 1.30, 7, and 10 at night, and on Sundays at 3. And then we've got, um, it's available 24-7 on the web at uh, hatfieldtv.pegcentral.com. Again, that's hatfieldtv.pegcentral.com, so you can... View the, view the shows at your leisure, as are all the other shows that we've done uh, over the course of the last year or so. So Marla, again, thank you very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. My uh, pleasure, thanks so much for having me. Good luck in your me. future endeavors. Thank you. And uh, thanks again for that essay about Rebecca Dickinson. Um, for Hatfield Currents, I'm Mike Cahill. Watch yourself, Hatfield.